Good evening, folks, or good afternoon, folks. I'm sorry, it's not evening. Uh, we are starting our stream at four o'clock. We're doing it a day late, but we're not a dollar short. Um, the subject is row, and uh, we're gonna go through how we got here. It's more complicated than you think. And we're gonna talk about the fact that we are the only people that can get us out of this. I'm not saying that the Biden administration can't help um, because they, they can. Um, and they, I know that on Friday they met with um, Democratic uh, governors remotely to work out strategy. Um, so that will all be happening, but all of this takes time. It took a long time to overturn Roe v. Wade. It's going to take a long time to get back our rights. So we're going to talk about that. We just share my screen here. So let's talk about exactly how we got here. So this is a really simplified version. I'm going to show you like the immediate things that happened that put Roe v. Wade in the crosshairs, okay? But it's way more complicated than this. So we're going to also, when we get to a certain point, we're going to flip over and we're going to look back, all the way back to 1973. So these are the five things. Uh, this actually came off Rachel Maddow's blog. Um, and yes, there are a lot of people who were completely taken by surprise by this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that nobody should have been taken by surprise like this. We were actually streaming in 2016 with women. Um, and we, when we raised the alarm about, uh, when we raised the alarm about the fact that uh, Donald Trump was talking about appointing judges who would overturn Roe. All we got from some of these women was that that was just a big distraction. Well, you know what? Um, that was not a big distraction because here we are. All right. So let's talk about what happened. So number one, the 2016 blockade. Now what that was, uh, was Barack Obama with 10 months left in his second term nominated a gentleman named Merrick Garland, who is now our attorney general. He uh, is a center left jurist. He is not a far left jurist, um, but probably a guy who would vote more than likely on the liberal side than the other side. What happened was uh, Mitch McConnell blocked that appointment. Uh, he decided that with 10 months left, it was, you know, the, the, uh, the appointment belonged to a new president, not to the president who was on his way out. Um, unfortunately, it was just left there to hang. Uh, no one argued it. Um, I don't believe that the Democrats had enough to override that kind of thing at that point anyway. Um, we were in the middle of a really vitriolic election with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, we didn't know which way it was gonna go. Uh, but then as we all find out, Trump was elected in 2016. We had four on the left and four on the right at that point and one that was blocked. So we had an opening. And uh, Donald Trump stated in a, uh, a speech in 2016 that he would appoint justices that would overturn Roe. So the first person that he, um, he put into play uh, was Neil Gorsuch. So as of early 2017, Senate rules still permitted filibusters for Supreme Court nominees. What happened is, uh, I believe the Democrats were thinking about filibustering that appointment. And 
what happened was the Republicans responded by executing what is called the nuclear option. And they confirmed him anyway. Now, this is where I think the filibuster is a problem. Um, I believe it's used to obstruct more than anything else. But in all reality, given what they actually did to Merrick Garland, uh, I can see why the Democrats would want to invoke the filibuster for Neil Gorsuch. Then what happened was Anthony Kennedy retired. He retired, it says here, in spite of the fact that he knew about Trump's corruption and radicalism, he retired and gave Donald Trump another appointment, and that became Brett Kavanaugh. He was pretty unpopular. He was pretty unpopular with the public and pretty unpopular uh, with the Senate. But the Republicans had a majority and they confirmed him anyway. And the GOP managed to expand its majority. Then what happened, the biggest travesty of all, in my opinion, in 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And uh, her dying wish was that the Senate would wait to confirm her successor until after the election, just like, uh, you know, they blocked Merrick Garland at the end of uh, at the end of um, Obama's term. But they did not do that. In fact, the same rules that the Republicans enforced on the Democrats were ignored when it became the Republicans' turn to confirm, and they rammed Amy Coney Barrett through. But now you have a six to three majority. On the conservative side, even though the voters then went ahead and elected a Democratic uh, president. But when people say, when people say they're, they're stunned by this, nobody should be, okay? Nobody should be, because this handwriting was on the wall for quite a long time, and we're gonna go into that a little bit, but you know, I got a couple of articles here, I'll put them in, I'm not gonna read them. Uh, Trump promised judges who would overturn Roe, that's not a surprise. Uh, in case you can't see the Washington Post, I will put this one in, you will be able to read that one. But let's go further back in time and look at Roe historically. What happened with Roe? In 1973, Roe was decided by the Supreme Court. Um, and in uh, Justice Harry Blackman actually wrote the opinion, finding that people have a constitutional right to an abortion in the first and second trimester. He, this was all based on privacy. Okay, the 14th Amendment, the right to privacy. In 1976, the Hyde Amendment passed for the very first time. What the Hyde Amendment does is prevent government funds from being spent on abortion services, except in the case of rape, incest, or threats to the life of the pregnant, the pregnant person. So in other words, if you have Medicaid um, and you need an abortion, you can't get it with Medicaid because that's a government funded, uh, gov government subsidized insurance program. So this was not just Republican driven. There, there were at the time in 1976, some Democrats who also believed that federal funding shouldn't be used for abortion. So there, there have been Democrats who have supported this. And back in 1976, Joe Biden was one of them. We'll, we'll get to that. In 1978, see, these are all the little things that aren't reported in the news, okay? A gentleman named James Bopp was named the general counsel of the National Right to Life Committee. And that was, at the time, the nation's leading anti-abortion group. He actually developed a strategy um, of taking an incremental approach to going after Roe v. Wade. And... That's exactly how we got here, incrementally over time. And it took them literally four decades to do this. But they understood that there was no way for them 
to just use power, you know, the bully pencil to make it happen. Okay. They, they got it. It was a long process. It was a long procedure. And, uh, and that became, that became the blueprint for how we got here. But in 1980, there became, you know, the ultimate marriage of what drove this. And that was when the Catholics and the evangelicals managed to bury their dogmatic differences in what people believe religiously about Jesus and God and all that shit and set their sights on Roe v. Wade. They put aside their differences, okay? And they combined forces to make abortion a national political issue. These are, let me just say this again, these are religions. It is the Catholic clergy and the right-wing Christians who united to make this alliance something we're still grappling with and they're getting more and more powerful and it's not just Roe v. Wade and we'll talk about that at the end. In 1992, um, there was a state level abortion case that was taken up by the Supreme Court, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. Um, it survived five to four. But the court declares the states can pass abortion restrictions as long as they don't pose an undue burden on the pregnant person and replace the trimester framework with the viability of the fetus standard. <clears throat> so following that ruling, most of what Pennsylvania sought to restrict abortion was enacted. And that's the beginning. Other states followed suit. 2006. Cecile Richards becomes president of Planned Parenthood. It was a move to build the group's political power and within, you know, throughout the country and within the Democratic Party. Now, anyone who knows who know who Cecile Richards is, she is Ann Richards' daughter, Ann Richards, who was the governor of Texas. Um, you know, people, you should know who Ann Richards is. She, she was quite a character. Um, she organized the group's chapters um, and, you know, Planned Parenthood became a force in the Democratic Party. Um, and the party actually, you know, put in their platform in 2012 that they supported Planned Parenthood. In 2009, Dr. George Tiller, a Kansas abortion provider, is murdered while serving as an usher at his church. It's the most extreme example of violence against uh, 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 an abortion provided by anti-abortion activists. This is not, this was not the only killing. There have been several. Uh, if you go, we'll put a, a link to the website in. Uh, there is a whole page on this that, that details uh, anti-abortion violence, which is why uh, we tell people now in the group, don't, don't talk about pro-abortion violence because we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going there. Um, it's unacceptable on one side. It's unacceptable on our side. In 2010, Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law. In order to get this enacted, he needed anti-abortion Democrats to pass it. So the bill included a compromise on abortion which was the Box and Nelson Amendment. It allowed states to prohibit plans in the insurance marketplaces from covering abortion, okay? He also signed an executive order declaring that the Hyde Amendment applied to the ACA. So in other words, even though we had a, uh, a government, uh, we, we, because we had a government supported and subsidized insurance plan, the Hyde Amendment, which restricts government funds to be used for abortion services, um, you know, was enacted, and and you know these are the these are the compromises our political system requires in order to get things done. Now, whether it's right or wrong, um, I you know I I'm not going to say that. I think that you know it would be great if it was simple. 
in this country, but it isn't. And it's not simple. And it's not just the government. We have 335 million people here. And to come to consensus on any one issue is a total fucking impossibility. So you're always going to have this. Um, in 2011, the House passes an amendment by then Representative Mike Pence to defund Planned Parenthood. It does not pass the Senate, but it becomes, you know, that uh, polarizing force between the two parties. At one one second, I wanted to make a quick comment. Was 2011 around the time that James O'Keefe was playing his games with uh, Planned Parenthood? Is that when he did his direct attack with his operatives? I think it was. I think it was. I think it was beginning at that time. I think it wasn't amped up until later on. But um, so it was absolutely a target from the beginning. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No. There's, there was no. Look, listen. Once once Planned Parenthood became, you know, part of the Democratic Party's. Um, platform, it, it became fair, fair game for these people. Um, so the organizations, um, you know, the, the abortion rights organizations capitalized on this and, and they, they did, you know, raise more money, 500% increase for Planned Parenthood. Uh, Narrow's email activism list grows by a thousand subscribers per day uh, after, after Pence's amendment. Um, so you know, again, we see the greatest influx of, of action once something is, is happening, which is what we see in our group with the overturn of Roe v. Wade, 800 people. All of a sudden, we've got 4,200 people. You know, this shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody, I have to tell you. Um, in 2012, the DNC pushes an abortion rights message at their convention. And uh, there's a new... There's, there's a new paragraph in the party plank that reads, the president and the Democratic Party believe that women have a right to control their reproductive choices. Democrats support access to affordable family planning services, and President Obama and Democrats will continue to stand up to Republican efforts to defund Planned Parenthood health centers. The Affordable Care Act ensures that women have access to contraception in their health insurance plan, and the president has respected the principle of religious liberty. Democrats support evidence-based and age-appropriate sex education. So then we get to 2016. Due in part to the movement that started after the ACA in 2010, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders called for repealing the Hyde Amendment in their presidential campaigns at, that spring. They also adopt that language in the party platform. Unfortunately, in November, Donald Trump was elected president and effectively delegates, ju delegates judicial selection to the conservative Federalist Society. It is the Federalists who actually provided him with Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And the rest is history, okay? You know, here we go. Now we start, we start amping up, okay? 2019, we start having laws that will be an abortion after the sixth week, okay? Um, and, you know, this is the first place where Joe Biden flips on the Hyde Amendment. He is now out there campaigning and endorsing that he will work on repeal of the Hyde Amendment. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies. You know that, I just went through that. And that starts the, the snowballing um, snowballing effect in the Supreme Court. In 2022, it's overturned. But if we look back even further, all of this movement started with George W. Bush. You know, we have President Trump now moving around the country, taking laps, you know, you know victory laps over, uh, over Roe v. Wade. But actually... Uh, George W. Bush. This is a long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, um, you know, Bill Crystal, who I believe is running, am I not correct? Did, did, did we hear that Bill Crystal's running somewhere for governor or for some such ridiculous? I, I, I'll check. I'll check. I believe I've heard that. So, uh, yeah. In the late 90s, he basically told the GOP that if you don't figure out how to overturn Roe and move toward a post abortion America, there will be no conservative future. So that became the litmus test for everything. So 
most of the judges then who who became uh, part of the Supreme Court, uh, they were appointed by Republican presidents and trained by the Federalist Society. And they are, you know, hardcore right wing foot soldiers. They're not compromisers. They're not precedent dwellers. Um, you know, with starting with Alito, um, he's the same way. He he was he was uh, he's pretty hardcore, and he was appointed uh, during um, during Bush. You know, Clarence Thomas, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett. These are the people, you know, that Trump is taking credit for. But the reality is. Um, that these people all worked uh, within the Bush administration at one point or another, okay? Who did uh, Roberts get appointed by? Was that uh, Papa Bush? He was, was he already there? He was already there, I believe, because he's a, yeah, I believe he's a chief, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so here's the deal. He, you know, when Bush, by, by the late 90s, he was, you know, being pressured to, uh, to prosecute physicians who violated, um, to, you know, who, who um, violated restrictions in the abortion, uh, in the abortion laws. So he was, he was uh, originally um, <laughs> told that, you know, they were claim, complaining that uh, the National Right to Life Committee, we mentioned er, uh, earlier, called him a, a good pro-life candidate in response to accusation that's, that he was soft on abortion. Um, he wasn't, okay? So he, he built on that whole anti-abortion thing. The first thing he did was he appointed Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson, uh, who was a rabid pro-lifer, to the uh, platform, to be on the platform committee. Um, and then he promised he, he, he was, th then, then they, they reached out for evangelical votes because it was a tight race between Gore and Bush. Um, they reached out for that and uh, he promised he would outlaw late-term abortions and improve a constitutional amendment banning abortion with exceptions for rape, incest, or risk to a pregnant person's life. Um, Gore fought against that, by the way. Uh, when we came to recount the ballots, okay, which would have determined the winner of that election between Gore and Bush. John Roberts, formerly the Solicitor General for George H.W. Bush, yep. went to Florida to talk to Jeb Bush about the role that the governor and the Florida legislator might play in the recount battle. So, Roberts was also instrumental in figuring out a strategy to bring that recount to the SCOTUS in case the Florida Supreme Court granted the Gore's campaign's request for a recount. It did. And then it was actually the Supreme Court that struck down that recount, just so everybody understands, all right? Brett Kavanaugh, who'd been a member of lawyers for Bush Cheney and a regional coordinator for Bush's campaign, joined Bush's legal team. You know, um, and at the time, the lawyers were additionally assisted by a young law firm associate named Amy Coney Barrett. All of this stuff, all of this stuff is part of the long history of Roe, okay? Um, he then, Bush then put in Tommy Thompson as the Department of Health and Human Services head. Um, he put in Alberto Gonzalez, uh, who was also one of the most conservative people on the planet. And then in 2003, it was Bush actually that uh, appointed Roberts to his first federal judgeship in the U.S. Court of Appeals. 
He also took on Kavanaugh as staff secretary. And he also signed the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, which was, you know, the name was, uh, was given to him by the National Right to, right to Life Committee. So this has been going on. I mean, you know, people need to understand that this was a long process to get here. I'm going to leave this article. This article is going to be in here. Everybody needs to read it. it. It's very long. It's very detailed. But there are things that you really need to understand because you need to understand in order to work within this system. And that's the only thing we have. OK, let me make that clear. Um, it's pretty clear that you know, resorting to violence like they did on January 6th is a no-go, okay? It didn't work in the 60s. It's not going to work now, okay? And just to say, I'm not going to participate, well, if you're not going to participate and not understand, then you're just basically handing the country over to the right wing, and it's going to get much worse from here. This will be in here. It's just, you know, the dissent by Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, right. Hagen uh, on on uh, the overturn of Roe. Nope, we don't need that shit. Now let's talk about the feminist movement because you know this is this is part of the problem as well. This is a really great article. I love the title. The feminist was a spook. Gloria Steinem. Sorry, folks. I might be you know slaughtering the golden goose here. But Gloria Steinem should never have been the face of the women's movement, never the face of feminism, and never the face of the pro-abortion movement. She has admitted to working for the CIA. She has admitted that when she couldn't raise money uh, to send students to other countries, that she took CIA money to do that. She has admitted to taking CIA seed money to start Ms. Magazine. And in case anybody wants to know why the CIA was involved here, it's because the CIA was very worried about the women's movement and the power it was gaining in this country. So essentially, Gloria Steinem, for all of her talk and all of her bullshit and all of her rhetoric, actually compromised the movement. She took this movement and, and took it away. It was multiracial. It was multicultural. And she turned it into a playground for rich white women, in my opinion. Um, you know... This, that, this article, this article has been around forever. I actually did a video on this, I don't know, back in, I think, 2013, when I was doing cocktails with the CIA, which was largely kind of a comedy thing, but, you know, the content was serious. Uh, there's another article here that's the same thing that you can read. Did feminism profit Gloria Steinem really work for the CIA? Yes, in fact, she did. And she is not uh, hidden that fact. So... When I see things like, and I don't have the article here, Meghan Markle and, uh, and Gloria Steinem are now traveling to Washington to have the Equal Rights Amendment, to campaign to have the Equal Rights Amendment put into our Constitution, I will say the same thing to you. Give me a fucking break, okay? Let me explain something to you. And I'm going to say it again. You are not going to get the Equal Rights Amendment put into the Constitution with a 50-50 split in the Senate and a very radical right-wing GOP. That is where we are now. We don't have compromised GOP people here anymore. They are gone. The ones who were those people, they have refused to run again. Adam Kinzinger, there's a bunch of people. There's five or six of them they are leading, okay? They're moving on. And those slots now open up for Donald Trump, you know, for people who support Trump. This is what I need you to understand. I don't understand why they're doing this, except that they need some publicity. Meghan Markle and Gloria Steinem go to Washington. It's a fucking junket. That's all it is. It is not going to happen. And I'm going to tell you right now, it pisses me off no end that this woman is taking advantage of this situation. That's just how I feel about it. We also have this little thing going on in America called male supremacy. I advise you all to read this because there are men out there who don't believe women should even have the fucking vote. Um, this is part of our website. This is the Southern Poverty Law Center's page, but we have built this into our website. You need to look at both places. So now we hear people say, we demand that you expand the Supreme Court. So let's talk about that. Back when FDR was, uh, was president, 
He had a plan to expand the Supreme Court. There's only one way to do that. You have to actually pass a law to make that happen. It's not like, you know, Joe Biden can wake up tomorrow and invoke his power as the president and appoint four new justices. Um, this was tried already. And, you know, I, I had somebody on Facebook say yesterday, well, you know, back in the day, FTI had guts. He stood up to everybody. He stood up to nobody. He stood up to nobody. He tried this. The battle was completely short and very brief. And he lost. He lost that battle. It did not happen. And the reason he did this to begin with was because he couldn't enact portions of his agenda. There's a reason why you can't just do this easily. All right. These are built into the system. And again, real quick, anyone who criticizes Biden for what? quote unquote, stacking the court. Number one, he didn't do it. Trump did it. Number two, he's doing this. If he does it, first off, he said he was reluctant to do it in the first place. He needs the people to demand it and then give him the votes in, in Congress to pass that law to get them in. And on top of that, you have to keep a Democrat in as POTUS for this to work. You can't add three judges and then have Biden lose. We've lost the war. You know, it's like you're yeah. just going to add three more conservative judges. And on top of that, if it was that easy, then guess what? Next term, the Republicans would, you know, would add three judges or whatever. Uh, the other thing. Just real quick, um, I have said the filibuster is a killer, especially given the fact that, and Deb said it too, that uh, Democrats don't use it, but the Republicans do. They play hardball. The Democrats don't. They, they're too mired in this play nice crap. But if we get rid of the filibuster, we better be damn sure that we're going to hold on to a majority for a while because... You know, one person goes out with a broken leg or with a medical issue like Patrick Leahy, we're in trouble. Right. That's another thing people need to, need to understand right now. Patrick Leahy broke his hip. He is out. He is. We are one vote down right this minute. OK, so people need to understand all of this. I don't know how long he's going to be out, uh, but he's having surgery and he's 82 years old and he's right. not coming back tomorrow. OK. Um, right. And by the way. This has already been proposed here. It is a very long shot plan to expand the size of the Supreme Court from nine to 13. It is sure to die in the Senate. It has to happen with a fucking piece of legislation. And there is no fucking piece of legislation that the GOP is going to allow. They will pull the filibuster. Yes, we have a 50-50 Senate, okay? So yes, technically speaking, Kamala Harris is indeed the tiebreaker. But I promise you the filibuster will be invoked long before she even has that opportunity. They right. will never go for this. They'll block the vote. The Supreme Court to begin with, to take away Roe v. Wade, the GOP is simply not going to allow this. Okay? You, you need 60 plus a cushion to to account for someone like Kristen, Kirsten Cinema or Joe Manchin or whatever that flips back and forth a little bit. So you need, the, you know, realistically, 62 or 63 people. But by the way, with regard to Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, Joe Biden has no power to remove them as Democrats. He's also got no power to force <laughs> them to vote a certain way. If you're unhappy with that, why don't you vote them out? That is on you. That is not on the government. We don't, they don't have the right to just remove senators because you don't like the way they vote. If you're pissed off at Kirsten Sinema, and I know the Arizona Democratic Party has promised to primary her in 2024. I haven't heard no. anything from the West Virginia Democratic Party, but I know Joe Manchin's constituents aren't happy about his position on Build Back Better, okay? where he joined with the Republicans. And by the way, the Republicans used the filibuster on Build Back Better and on the Voting Rights Act. So if you don't think this series about blocking everything Joe Biden's done, maybe you should read the newspapers instead of reading some memes.
So here we have Biden's thorny options for changing the Supreme Court. There aren't many. Okay. By the way, no executive order. Stop that too, please. Right. So he did have, uh, he did appoint a commission to study the Supreme Court and to recommend suggested changes. Um, while he was running for president, he ruled out term limits for justices, okay? He's also not a fan of court packing. Um, what we really need to do is elect more people to Congress because when something gets to the Supreme Court, it's gotten there because it's been challenged all along the way uh, on a legislative basis. And this is really where we have the power, okay? Now, we're not saying that we don't support court reform. We actually do. Uh, but I've heard people say justices should only have four-year terms. No, I, I don't. I think it needs to be longer than that for continuity and for precedent. I don't agree with lifetime terms. I don't know what that should be. I'm not going to just throw a number out there until I think about it more. But uh, I don't believe that anything should have a lifetime appointment. I also believe, you know, as I've said you know, when I was talking to Sarah before we went on, we talked about the fact that, okay, so we know that, you know, Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett, Gorsuch all basically kind of lied during their, you know, their confirmation process, talking about the fact that they rule on precedent. They clearly didn't with Roe v. Wade. We had 50 years of precedent there. All right. We know they lied. We need to make you understand again what it takes to remove a justice by impeachment. Again, it requires a bigger majority than what we have. You just can't, the president just can't remove an appointed justice for wrongdoing. We need to make sure that we have accountability things built into the court. We need to think about the way they're selected. We also need to think about the confirmation process. Maybe the people should get to vote on the, on the justices. Maybe it's one of those things where the people should have a collection and we can pick the one we think we should have. I don't really know the answer. I know things have to change, but I really don't know what that looks like yet. Right now, I'm more focused on what we can do these are long-term, okay? So let me just read this part to you. What would it take to expand the court? Because the constitution is silent on court size, expanding it could be done through the regular legislative process by which all laws are made. But that means Democrats would need a supermajority of 60 votes in the Senate where they control just 50 votes currently. And because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are assholes to the 10th degree, Sometimes it's only 48 votes. Or they would have to do away with the filibuster. The unwritten Senate practice that requires 60 votes to pa pass major legislation. On the question of killing the filibuster, Democrats are not united on that. That doesn't mean they won't be. It just means that they're not right now. Yeah, I, I have a question real quick about uh, bypassing the filibuster. Biden saying that he'll bypass the filibuster to codify Roe. What well, does you, that? Well, basically, the, the Republicans have done that, too. When they try to filibuster a Supreme Court justice, I just went through that back there. You, they, 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 they invoked the nuclear option where you just do oh. it anyway. Okay. okay. When you're in power, you can invoke the nuclear option and you can pass it anyway. Now, Biden has said he's, he will consider that. Okay. Right? That's what he's talking about. Okay. Gotcha. So let's talk about where our strength is. Right now, the battle is in the states. Oh, I don't want a daily thing of Boston news. I want the goddamn page to come up. That's what I want. That's what I want. I want it to come up. There we go. So the battle goes to the states, and I'm going to just show you a few things here. These will all be in the, uh, in the video. 
The court temporarily blocks Utah's trigger ban that would have made abortions illegal. And these are, notice these are all temporarily. This will be challenged, okay? This is the way this goes now. It's back and forth in the court system. And I would like to remind you um, that Donald Trump made over 200 appointments on the federal level while he was president. Uh, not just the Supreme Court, but all of the courts throughout the country. And that was, you know, driven by Mitch McConnell, who said he didn't want to leave one seat open, and he didn't. I got a headache here. Now, New York Times, I don't want to subscribe. So apparently this is not going to allow me to <clears throat> show you until I log in. I actually have a subscription to the Times. I was logged in a minute ago, but I don't know where that went. So I'm just going to make sure it's in here. I'm going to also find it from a second source. Um, here we go. Texas law banning abortion temporarily blocked by the court. This is another one. Texas law was at six weeks. So this has been temporarily blocked by the courts. Uh, again, this will be challenged. This is not gonna just die here, um, but it's a small victory, but it is where right now, this is where the battle is. And we're gonna talk about how that battle plays out uh, with the next election as well. That's an article, that was an article, that article I couldn't pull up, which is this one is about Kathy Hochul who um, basically knew this was coming and went to work beforehand. She was, you know, she basically called the overturn of Roe, um, you know, heinous on all levels. And, and so she went to work even before it happened. She knew it was coming. And she signed uh, a package of six bills that protects both patients and providers. So abortion is safe in the state of New York. Um, and this is where our strength lies. So let me talk about this for a minute. Kathy Hochul is an example of a Democratic governor who needs to win her election when it comes up. Kathy Hochul is also an example of the kind of Democratic governor that we need across the nation. We have 36 governorships up for grabs. Right now, in 2022, there will be 36 states who are running governor, running, you know, who have governor, you know, gubernatorial elections. We need as many, in order for Roe to, to, to start making its way back, we need as many governors that are Democrats in these positions. This is your, this is your, this is now your gateway to abortion access is the governorships because right now the battle is in the states whether we want it to be there or not this is what this is what we've been handed and we need to work with it Massachusetts has a governorship up but in the meantime we have a republican governor here who has signed an order protecting abortion providers so Massachusetts was already safe for women who need an abortion, but Baker signed in order to protect an abortion provider so that we can service people from other states. Charlie Baker, we don't have any, um, we don't have any term limits in Massachusetts for the governorship. Charlie Baker is choosing not to run again. Charlie Baker is another one of those Demo another one of those Republicans who's just can't pay fealty to this Republican party. So he is not running for re-election. Actually, he was very good during COVID. Uh, he bucked the Trump administration from start to finish. So it's no surprise um, that Donald Trump has taken responsibility for getting rid of him. But the fact is Charlie Baker is his own man. And if he thought it was worth his while to be governor again, he would run again. So where does that leave the state of Massachusetts? We have... Uh, a woman who was running, Mara Healy, who is now our attorney general. 
you know, there was a recent article that says she's set to go further than any woman in Massachusetts in her run for a governor. You know what? The people of Massachusetts had better vote for Mara Healy because the Trump endorsed candidate is a crazy man. I'm just going to tell you right now, uh, Jeff, Jeff Deal, I met him at a gun show. And the only reason I went to a gun show was to just see what kind of people went to gun shows. Um, I met and talked to him at a gun show. Uh, he wants to criminalize abortion. And there's a woman running on the other side who's a right winger. She doesn't have Trump's endorsement, but she's as crazy as Jeff Deal is. Mara Healy, on the other hand, uh, is very popular in Massachusetts. She's an excellent attorney general. And she would be the very first, not only female governor of Massachusetts, but the first female in LGBTQ governor of Massachusetts. I'm encouraging people in Massachusetts to get off the sofa and get your ass to the polls. Because while we have an overwhelming majority of Democrats in our legislature, we do not want to give the governorship to a radical right-wing Donald Trump supporting male. Okay, understand me. Gretchen Whitmer. Embattled would be, you know, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't even know why she wants this fucking job, to be honest with you. Gretchen Whitmer has no option in her state. Let me take that. Let me go to the next one first, actually. Her current legislature, there is no common ground on abortion for her. She has a Republican legislature. She can do nothing to support women by legislation like Kathy Hochul could, or like, you know, uh, Charlie Baker. Um, it's a Republican controlled state legislature. It's, it's as a state. All right. So let me explain this to you. Roe v. Wade doesn't even matter in that state because that state has had a ban on abortion since 1931. So she can't even overturn that ban because all of her legislature supports that ban. She's powerless, basically. So what she did is she filed a motion in the Michigan Supreme Court to protect constitutional right to abortion. She's trying to see if she can somehow get them to rule and codify this in the state constitution. We'll have to see how that turns out. Um, she did this on June 24th. I don't think there's been a ruling yet. At least I couldn't find one before the show uh, to, to be able to present it to you, but she's doing what she can. I'm, I'm basically just picking people, you know, in various states that have been considered battleground states or, you know, to see what they're doing. And, and, I, and honestly, Gretchen Whitmer is doing everything that she has in her arsenal to try to make it happen. Right now, Illinois is that sanctuary, that state's uh, sanctuary state, by the way. And now, uh, Dave, I, I'm putting this in for you because I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. The only thing I can say about this fucking guy is I yeah. keep getting a look in his face half the time when I see him. You know, so now he's uh, coming out with this great new uh, marketing plan. You know, it's about the culture of life. You know what? I I'm so fucking sick of all of this doublespeak. It is basically about anti-abortionists. That's what it's about. It's about taking away a woman's right to choose. It's not about the culture of life. So I, I knew you were going to put this in, so I, I did a quick check. Mississippi allows 15-year-old girls to get married to sweaty old, you know, middle-aged hillbilly men with, with parental consent. They cannot get divorced until 18. So if they are, you know, impregnated, they're trapped. How is that the culture of life, trapping a 15-year-old girl in Mississippi with, with a child and not being able to get out? 
not being able to divorce, not being able to get an abortion. What happens if the man leaves, dies, whatever, or is abusive? She's stuck. She's stuck. If, if she's being physically and emotionally abused, she can do nothing because she's a minor. Okay. And if he leaves her, she is financially stuck, ruined, whatever. So how is that a culture of life? These people are full of shit. They just simply are. As is Lauren, Lauren Bobert, who recently said that it is not the government's job to protect the, its citizenry. It's the government's job to make sure they're free. <laughs> How are we doing that? By the way, Mississippi, it is the Mississippi law. Yep. Resulted in the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Yep. The 15 week law. This is yep. this is what this is the case that went to the Supreme Court. Yep. So here's I, what I'm gonna tell you. Yep. Now this is what you need to do. You need to get on the Good Market Institute website. You need to understand where your state stands. You need to understand just what the laws are. This is the place to get it. And they honestly update their website every single day. They are, always have the latest information here. They are one of the best resources you can ever, you know. You know, I, I agree that Planned Parenthood has a great site, but this site. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. By the way, on Sunday, don't go, hey, wait a minute. You know, on Friday, it said this, and then it changed on Saturday. They're not going to do it over the weekend. So just, just chill. But during the weekdays, yes, yeah, it's, it's day by day. It gets, it gets, uh, and typically nothing will happen over the weekend anyway. So this is the other thing you need to do. You need to vote. When we go out, Sarah and I next week in Boston, it's not going to just be holding signs and screaming. We need to start talking to people about getting to the polls. This has got to happen, people. I, I don't know any other way to say this. But this is the power you have. And, you know, when I, when, when, when people want to talk about, you know, the things we can and cannot do in this country, you know, forget the fucking masks and all that stuff. That, that's not the oppression. While you were all focused on that, this is what's been going on. Okay. You need to exercise your power in a country where we are allowed to vote for 50% to turn out to be considered a high number. It's absurd to me. It's absurd to me. While they're preventing people of color from voting by gerrymandering districts in Florida, they allowed the governor to do it. The legislature ceded their power to the governor, the little dictator, to redistrict. Okay? It was challenged by a rights group. And it went to the Florida Supreme Court, who decided it was too close to the election to change it. They're going to let it stand. This it's unconscionable that people don't show up when there are people who want to show up who are going to be kept away from voting. So I'm going to close with these last two. This is an opinion piece. This is actually written by uh, Hermione Palacio, who is the CEO of um, the Guttmacher Institute. So this is, this is how the Biden administration should stand up for abortion rights. And all of this is nice, and all of this is good, but let me just tell you the reality. Um, so we know, it's the, uh, we know it's the low income people who are gonna pay the price. We understand that. Um, They are, and I and I and I believe I don't know when this was written. What when, what's the date on this one? Okay, that was 20, yeah, January 2021. 2021. Uh, we're gonna look. I'll I'll look into this uh, for the next time we we uh, we talk about this, um, or maybe I'll make a video during the week. Whether they actually rolled back the global gag rule, uh, which would would which would put back into play Title Title Ten National Family Planning Net Network, which would 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 mean people around um, 
the country could take, you know, could take part in this, but I, I don't know that, that this would, you know, I think they can do it by executive order. I'm not sure. Um, I think Trump did do that by executive order, if I remember correctly. So it can be overturned and, and Biden may have already done this. Um, but to be perfectly honest with you, this was before the overturn of Roe v. Wade. So this might not matter at this point. Um, suspend the in-person dispenser inquired from the uh, Mepristone, which is also a medication, the abortion pill. You have been able to get that online. Um, and, and the Biden administration has said that um, the road decision does not apply to medication. They will fight that. Um, they, the Justice Department has said that people will have access to that. That uh, drug specifically, actually, yeah. Yes. And uh, they also said that they cannot stop, states cannot stop women from traveling state to state to get abortion services. They will protect a woman's right to do that. They cannot restrict interstate travel. Uh, again, leaving the, the Hyde Amendment out of the budget. He has done that twice. Okay, he's done that. And, and the budget did not pass because the Hyde Amendment wasn't in there. So the Hyde Amendment had to go back in in order to get the budget passed. You people need to understand again, we need a bigger majority to make this kind of shit happen. Um, then there's the Helms Amendment, which would be the use of US foreign assistance to, to support abortion services. This is more of a worldwide issue. Um, this is so that we can help people in other countries have access to safe abortions. All of that is great, but it doesn't solve our problem here. Um, that's a big picture look, by the way. You know, that's not, you know, in all fairness to uh, Palacio, this was written before Roe v. Wade was overturned. So all of those things are nice. And again, I will reiterate that Joe Biden left the Hyde Amendment out of the budget. And uh, that did not work because we did not have a big enough majority. And by the way, Joe Biden back in the day was in favor of the Hyde Amendment. He is no longer in favor of the Hyde Amendment. He hasn't been for a while. So that is basically um, where we are. I'm going to stop the screen share for the moment. Yeah, I, got, I have a couple things, uh, actually three. Number one, uh, Everyone needs to look at their state assembly. I actually spoke with an assembly member in my state recently who said that they lost the uh, primary because the turnout was awful. I don't think people realize how important the state assembly members are. They're, they're kind of like what Congress is to the president, they are to the governor. So in order to get anything changed, you not only need a Democratic governor right now, you also need a Democratic assembly. And it is very easy for those assembly people to be shuffled around and, and voted out because oftentimes they are forgotten. And then you get a Gretchen Whitmer situation like Deb was talking about. Number two, um, Gavin Newsom. Personally, I think he's a badass. I have no problem with him criticizing another governor. This whole stay out of your state and all this crap. Give me a break. All right. These governors. They don't own the fucking airwaves. They, they don't number one, the they airwaves. don't own the airwaves. And also, uh, they drive national policy. They do. Okay. So. If they didn't drive national policy. Donald Trump wouldn't have put that on his agenda as being number the, the number one position to go after was the governorship. Now the Democrats are doing it. In hindsight, I might add, we need to vote and you need to get out there. And we have 36 governorships up and they need to be Democratic governors. Your governors, your senators, and your state assembly people. Uh, my governor, Hochul, that mentioned her, another badass doing everything she possibly can in regards to gun laws, in regards to working with her assembly and getting, piecing together legislation to protect women. Um, so if you want 
New York to stay the way it is and stay a fighting state and fighting for the people. Don't vote for Lee Zeldin. That's all I got to say, because <laughs> he's a Trump toad. OK, he will not work for the people. I'm telling you right now. So I can't endorse anyone formally, but I think you get get my drift. Uh, finally, all these people who are saying they're pro-life. We did a video last night, an eight minute video on uh, gun rights. Again, a sniper today around 10 a.m. in Highland Park, a, sub a suburb of Chicago. Chicago, I lived in Chicago. Um, there was a beach parade. A sniper was able to get on the roof, kill at least five people, injure at least 19. The numbers are going back and forth. It's six, it's six and 20. I, I'm, you know, I'm going with the low number for now, but it's probably going to be more between eight and 10 when, when all is said and done. Um, no, but so another gun rights today. Break another. Give me a fucking break, people. Another mass shooting. OK, another mass shooting in Illinois. It's it's unbelievable in the face of all this that the people aren't up in arms. I, I just I don't see it. I, I just don't understand it. You know, if you're feeling hopeless, it's because you're making yourself hopeless. All right. By the way. You got to do this something. was this was a beach parade with parents and kids and and the whole nine yards. It wasn't like a protest or anything like that. It so July Fourth celebration is. It was a July Fourth beach celebration. Give me a break. The culture of life. Yeah. Okay. The culture of life. Yeah. Let me let me talk to you about one more thing. We are. We are facing full on fascism here, all right? I would like to make everybody aware of the fact that women aren't the only people in danger. The LGBTQ community, the transgender community. Now the, the Democrats just, just unveiled the Transgender Bill of Rights. It will sail through the house. It will die on the doorstep of the Senate because we don't have a big enough majority. The LGBTQ community is quote, bracing itself for a rollback of their rights in the post row world because all of these things were argued on the same basis of privacy, okay? The privacy issue now is up for grabs. What I'm telling you is this, women are 51% of the population, you need to vote. LGBTQ Americans need to vote. Transgender people need to vote. And all of us, and, and by the way, we need to band together with, with, with people of color and low-income people because we are the Democratic Party base. This is us. We are their base, okay? We not only need to vote, but we need to collectively get together and fight this shit en masse as a group instead of saying, that's your worry, that's your worry. I don't know, so right. trans people in. Give me a fucking break, people. Give me a break, okay? Wake up. I have one more. I have one more thing because I I saw someone and uh, I see a lot of TikTok videos now. All right, all these people are openly criticizing their own party. Here is a little tip. Here is a little tip. Okay, you're playing right into their hands. Enjoy you're it. You're playing it. You're playing into their hands. If you have a problem with your party, work within the party to change it. Do not openly show their weaknesses because you will lose the party. The party will lose the the um, they'll they'll lose the the races. And you'll have all these Republicans. in. I'm not saying don't criticize them but what i'm saying is just be careful when you openly criticize them what i'm saying is just be careful about openly criticizing the party if you're not looking at yourself in the mirror because this has been coming for a long time and this power is with you as well nope. listen to me you have problems if you come into my i'm going to i want to address this issue now because we had a problem with somebody this morning in the group oh yeah okay you will <laughs> have a problem in this group for any reason, unless you do several things. Number one, do not think you're gonna come into the group and espouse for violence. 
The people who were complaining about the fact that abortion clinics were bombed and burned are now talking about being violent on the other side. We're not condoning violence on any level, anywhere, at any time in our group, okay? Number two, do not come into the group and suggest to us that we have to work with the right wing and bring them over to our way of thinking. You know what? We fucking tried that from 2016 to 2020. Guess what? They stuck it up our ass. We are never doing that again. Right. Actually, 2021. <laughs> there is nobody. There is nobody on that side. The people who brought us here are not going to liberate us. We right. have to do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Number three. Do not come into the group and say that voting is meaningless because you will be bumped out of the group. If you're not voting, then you're shutting the fuck up. That's the way I'm looking. <laughs> it's pretty clear what we have to do. We have an overwhelming, overwhelming majority in the House. We need to keep that at the midterms. We need to keep it. I don't care if we grow it, but we can't let any of it go. We have a 50-50 split in the Senate with a rabid GOP that is as far right it is, as it has ever been in its history, okay? There is no rationalizing or reasoning with them. They will use the filibuster. They will block whatever they can. We need to pick up seats in the Senate in a big way. Thirdly, let me just remind you of something. Hey, you want three or four? I don't even remember. I don't know what the fuck I'm on. <laughs> let, me just, let me just say this. If the GOP is in power at the end of the midterms, it's game, set, and match for democracy. This is what's going to happen. They have openly stated they will do everything in their power to stymie Joe Biden for his final two years in office. Personally, I don't even know why Joe Biden took this fucking job. All right. I, I really don't. Okay. They will stymie him. They have already met with an outside think tank. These are your taxpayer dollars at work, folks. And they don't, they, they don't just use Republican people's tax money when they do this. They use everybody's. They have met with an outside consulting group to drum up 23 investigations they can pull on the Biden committee. He's already had to change his lawyers and change the focus of his attorneys to be ready for that because he's not sure how the midterms are going to come out. Understand this. He will just be in a totally defensive position for two years and nothing will change. In fact, I promise you, if they're in power, you will have a national abortion ban at the blink of an eye and it will get worse from there. You need to wake up now, right? What's going on right now should be driving people to the polls. You know yep. what? If it's not driving people to the polls, there's something wrong with you. I'm just saying that. Uh, number five or six or four, whatever the hell it is. Finally, anyone who tells me or Deb or Sarah or whatever that we've been infiltrated or influenced or whatever, what influenced us was seeing the oppressive legislation put through by the right wing. What influenced us was Trump's response to the COVID, uh, to the COVID pandemic. What triggered us was someone within our group after January 6th, and by the way, yeah, January 6th was a big trigger too, advocating for violence, and we had to kick that person out. Those are the things that triggered us. All the anti-trans bills, all the uh, talk about the word slavery being changed to involuntary displacement, all this crap, okay? That's what changed our mind and changed our tune. We reacted to what was happening and what is happening at the time. And we realize that right now, the Democrats, right this second, are the only way to, to change this in the short term. In the long term, who the hell knows? I, I don't see it changing anytime soon, but we'll deal with that when it happens. We haven't been infiltrated. We haven't been, you know, corrupted, brainwashed, whatever the shit you want to say. And if you're trying to do that, you're wasting your damn time. So, by the way, we're also not uh, advocating for, uh, I'm going to say this again, uh, for Rick or self-governance, because I really... Yeah. You know, look at this. We have First of all, self-governance works in small, in small areas. 
335 million people, you, you will be forced to work with the right. The right doesn't want to work with the left. The right just wants what it wants. And I'm sorry, but if you can't get out to vote on legislation, I have no hope that the people will generate legislation. So that is a no-go. Sorry, I really do see uh, that if we degenerated into that level, it would be mass chaos here and nothing more than that. And we would also have the wild, wild west with the guns and you know, the policemen from the citizenry taking care of all the bad guys here. I just, you know what? That's a no-go for me. It's not going to ever right. up in my lifetime. I'm too old for that shit now. So <laughs> here we are. We're closing this out. Dave's got to go to work. Yeah. Well, I've got to go to the job. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, will, uh, we will see you again uh, soon, next week. Anything else before we go? Enjoy your day. Uh, I'll stop depressing you, but we have to we we do have to stay activated yep. and you know i hate the word the terms wake up but you have to you have to see what the republicans are doing you have to see their tactic and the fact that they're working with they they their ally is very powerful and in, in the christian right well, very yeah. powerful there is a big christian nationalist movement in this country you need to visit huge. The, website. the website is kind of like tie, ties all of this together Roe right. v. Wade with everything else. It's, it's a big panoramic look of your future under the GOP. All right. Oh, it's yeah. One final one. It's close. One final thing I wanted to say when Biden or any Democrat legislator says they want to codify Roe. They're not saying they want to codify Casey. It's a power move. They're going back to the original case, okay? You have to understand, that's a power move. They're going back to 1973, not the back to 1992. Yeah. So if they're going to pull, pull this shit, we can pull this shit. If there's no precedence with Roe, then there sure as hell ain't no precedence with Casey now is there, so we can codify Roe. Right. And by the way, the fact that we were going back to 1973 is the reason why Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski wouldn't cross the aisle and sign on to codify Roe. So right. instead they wrote this limp ass little three page bill, which will never be given a number and never <laughs> see the light of day in the Senate because the GOP doesn't want it to be there. So forget it. Don't even think about it. All that yeah. was was Susan Collins trying to save face. They wanted to codify Casey, to be honest with you, but we're not going to do that now. Nope. nope, not good enough. We'll talk to you guys next week. All right. Damn it. Still recording, I think. Yeah, I know. I'm shutting it now. I'll just. <laughs>